So one of the nice things about putting this conference together is we get to meet people that we didn't even know existed. Um, and as we've uh, found people along the way, um, some of whom you've heard and some of whom you'll hear in a few minutes, uh, this next group is one that came highly recommended to us when we said, well, we really, we really want to find out more about what's happening um, in the area of uh, trauma and survivors of torture. This organization was recommended to us. So I'm pleased to, I'm going to let them introduce themselves as they go along. Um, our group today is from the Western New York Center for Survivors of Torture. Um, and they will be presenting for us, um, I'm told, which will be a very interesting um, present, uh, group of activities and presentations. So we'll take it away. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Um, uh, I'm Pam Caffey, and I am the Director of Program Development and Integration at Jewish Family Service in Buffalo, New York. And one of my um, primary responsibilities is the development of the Center for Survivors of Torture. Um, I thank you very much for inviting us to come today. This is very exciting. Um, I find it ironic that I happen to be in Amsterdam at a conference when I got your email inviting us to this event. Um, so um, I'm going to just do a brief introduction, and then we have, uh, we're sort of all jumping in and out of the presentation at different points, and we have some things planned to help all of us begin to better understand what, it, what, what is this work, who are the, who are the people that we, you know, that we work with. Um, so the Center for Survivors of Torture is part of um, larger immigrant services. Um, so we do refugee resettlement. We have parent support programs, we have health, um, health home, care coordination program, career services, and then the Center for Survivors of Torture. So, and I, I tell you this because a lot of the questions that have been popping up, maybe things we can help people talk through um, as it pertains to refugees coming to the United States. Um, we're very grateful for the presentation prior. I think that set the tone perfectly for the things that we're going to discuss. Um, we may repeat a few things or expand upon some of the concepts. Um, how do I put this forward? Is it? Yeah. Um, okay, so before we get into layouts, um, I just wanted to quickly go down the line, ask you to refer to the bios if you want to learn a little bit more about each of us. Um, but Leonce is a care coordinator at the center. He comes to us from Rwanda. He's our newest member of the team. Um, he is a psychologist um, back home. Um, Salah is our project coordinator, and he's been with me since the beginning of the project. Um, he has extensive overseas NGO experience. Um, we're really lucky to have him help keep our data in order and all of our protocols in place. Amela is a care coordinator. She um, comes from Bosnia uh, originally, and um, she is uh, has a background in community mental health. She um, also owns uh, the best restaurant in Buffalo, which I have to tell you, I'm <laughs> sorry. She's a very busy woman. Um, it's, a, it's an incredible Bosnian restaurant. Um, and Ali Kadam is a care coordinator at our program, but he's also a mental health counselor at a local um, mental health clinic, which is a wonderful sort of integration for us. Um, and Ali, he's from Iraq, did I say that? Um, he's also the president of the Buffalo um, Immigrant and Refugee Empowerment Coalition, as well as the Iraqi American Society, which is also a nice integration because it helps us really make connections with the ethnic-based community organizations, which are critical to our success as well. So I'm going to turn it over to the else. Hi, good morning, all of you. Uh, thank you, Pam, for the introduction. Uh, as Dr. Sharma uh, discussed uh, earlier, uh, we have many refugees with trauma history, uh, and have still have trauma. Uh, so we're going to take you through uh, some definitions we're going to be using. Uh, so we, uh, those people uh, have been uh, exposed to war, political violence, and torture. So our center uh, focuses more on the torture uh, side of it. Uh, even if we, doesn't, uh, we don't um, exclude anybody who have been uh, in a traumatic uh, situation, but we focus more on uh, people who have been tortured back in their countries. Um, so those people have been living in region affected by bombing, shooting, um, looting, and uh, forced displacement. Um, some of those have been soldiers themselves or 
also child soldiers, like some have been child soldiers, um, guerrillas, and um, other combatants. So they have many traumatic uh, events happen to them back in their countries. But when they come here, they got services as other refugees, but they have the other dark side that needs to be addressed. So that's why we are there. Uh, there are two definitions of torture. One definition is according to the UN, but the US has its own definitions. We're going to talk about the difference at the end. Uh, a torture is any act uh, by which severe pain or suffering, uh, whether physical or mental, there are two sides of it, the physical and mental. Uh, when that act is intentionally inflicted on a person, it means intentionally, it's not accidental or a coincidence, it's intentionally uh, inflicted to that person. For which purposes? Uh, obtaining uh, from him for information for the person himself or a third person. Sometimes you have the person tortured, like the kid tortured for the parents to give information, or vice versa. Uh, we, for a confession, for a confession, especially in uh, political um, situations, um, punishing him uh, or punishing the person on the behalf of, the, of a third person, so punishing the parent for what the, uh, the son has done and the son is not there, so they have to torture the parents for the thing that the son has done. Um, and also in order to intimidate or coerce him or a third, a third person um, based on a discrimination or of any kind. And that, when such pain of suffering is inflicted by or an investigation uh, with consent or acquiescence of a public official. A public official has to be um, uh, present or have to command the act of uh, torture. So that's the that's definition uh, from the UN. Uh, or a person acting in an official capacity. That doesn't include uh, Pain or suffering arising only from uh, lawful sanction. If it's a lawful sanction, they don't consider it uh, being uh, torture. For the U.S. definition, we have all of that, but that person tortured has to be in custody or physical control. So that's one uh, thing that the U.S. have added. We define the person as a victim of torture for the U.S. definition if that person has been in custody or physical control. Um, so Pam is going to come back here again and take you through an exercise that's going to let you understand um, what is it like what is it like to be um, a refugee and uh, what it takes and what are the problems those people have when they arrive here. Then after we're going to continue.
think for a minute about what those four things would be. And put, write that down in, in one of these squares. And so now you're out. You've lost your chance. If you didn't fill your four squares, it's too late. The house is not yours anymore. You've been taken out of your home. And I'm wondering what that what that feels like to you. And I wonder if anybody has a, a the a willingness to share what's on your paper. I will clear passport, my degree, cash, or credit card. Okay. So that was passport, degrees, cash, and credit card. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Um, I said a picture of my family. Okay. The Bible and IDs. Identification? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I put uh, identification, like passport, food, water, money, and um, my mala, prayer beads. Okay. I'm, I'm hearing some themes. We have spirituality, economic security, and identity, whether it's in regards to your identity card or your degrees, which often are part of our identity. Yes. Medications. Okay. Uh, clothing, blankets, food. Basic, basic needs items. Okay. Is there anybody in the room who'd be willing to share if you've actually been in this situation before and you've had to take items quickly? Um, from my experience, uh, and this helped Citizenship documents, of course, children and family, <laughs> money if you have, and certificates and documents are very, very important. Um, so a lot of times when people leave, they don't actually have time to go hunting through their files for those documents. And they're, they're fortunate if they happen to be handy. Um, and I find it interesting that the things we wish we could take are sometimes the things we absolutely need to have, especially those degrees, I find, and the documents, because at some point when you go out, um, you have to prove that you're a refugee, and you have to present yourself to the United Nations, and it's really hard to, to go through those processes without those, those documents. So, um, I'm not that you want to contribute. Okay. This is working. Okay. Um, I was in that kind of situation, you mentioned that you actually do not think about your degrees or your education. The only thing that uh, matters at that time is your safety. So basically, I uh, was in a situation myself and my family, and uh, uh, we find ourselves without anything. You don't think about it, even though you have a couple minutes. You don't think what you need. I just put down water and food. Shut down that happened many years ago. 
So the refugees, I may say that refugees is not um, negative only, but you can see how people come to Buffalo, you can see, they can see how refugees have brought the best they have, and they are building the cities with the local people. Um, so, 35% of the population, the refugee population, they seem to have um, or struggling with the consequences of trauma or torture. I'm going to develop more about that. Um, that's the number 69,000 uh, 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 refugees resettled in the US. Uh, 2015, and we have 4,052 uh, who were resettled in New York State, and um, between 2010 and 2014, uh, 6,000 refugees have been uh, resettled in Erie County. The Erie County is the area where Buffalo is. So these are refugee arrivals, 2014, uh, that's 69,000. Um, 2015, uh, that was ceiling of 70,000. Um, 2016, that will be um, at the end of the, this year, the U.S. will receive um, 85, uh, 85,000 refugees. And the proposed uh, ceiling for 2017 uh, is 100,000. So, more refugees are coming in and they will need those services and uh, they will need those services providers. Among those refugees, we, have, we expect more torture survivors. As I said before, we have 35% of refugees who are torture survivors. Torture is not something that is done uh, in public. Torture is something that is done uh, it's hiding, it's difficult to get the data. And most of the people who have been tortured, they don't like to talk about it. Because even talking about it is a, sometimes a very traumatic and traumatic thing to do. So the data is not um, available, but most of the service providers estimate that 35% of the refugees and asylum seekers that we have has uh, trauma or torture, uh, torture uh, past uh, history. So we have a small video. Yeah, I was going to say something about. Um, I just I realized that we didn't really um, sort of warn people ahead of time, um, or at least give people permission to um, personally select out of certain parts of our presentation. But some of the things that we talk about, and in particular in this video, can be very difficult to watch. Um, I myself, you know, leave rooms regularly when I'm at trainings about torture. Um, so, you know, please just be forewarned. We get into some tough topics. If you want to walk around, um, and check out, whatever you need to do. Uh, but I just didn't want anybody to be um, unaware as we press play. Lamy on the ground, one of the members of the rebel said he was hungry. So I take his intestine and cook it for food. The gash me here in my stomach. But when I open my eyes, I have spent five days in the Ecoma hospital.
but we also think that there's a need to expand that concept to refugee trauma and trauma care, where we really need to be incorporating um, concepts of linguistic and cultural competency into that conversation um, in order for us to be truly effective and provide the quality um, service. Um, we're um, not a clinical model, we're not a medical model. Um, we understand that the majority of our clients aren't seeking traditional mainstream American mental health services. Um, if through the course of working with somebody it's determined that that would be a good referral, then we link people in with certain hand selected people in the community that we believe can do the work. One being Lakeshore Behavioral Health where Ali works, um, and then also Jewish Family Service has an um, in-house mental health clinic, and so we will make referrals to that program as well. That is not our primary focus in the service delivery. Um, we got seed funding from the State Health Foundation. Um, we partner with another local organization for legal services and the University of Buffalo Department of Family Medicine. One of our uh, uh, important services is forensic evaluations for uh, asylum seekers. So refugees come with benefits. They have status and access to benefits. Asylum seekers end up here a variety of ways and do not have access to any uh, employment authorization, food stamps, Medicaid, they can't find any public housing, they're really uh, pretty much homeless. Um, and so one of our objectives is to try to help people get status so they can get to work and get to benefits. So we do a head-to-toe physical assessment uh, to document the signs of torture, or we do a psychological assessment. Um, and so we have a cadre of trained um, physicians and mental health providers who will do that work in collaboration with the University of Buffalo. Um, and through this work, we um, there's been a human rights initiative at University of Buffalo Medical School. So we have all, uh, students who do all the scribing for those sessions, and they're actually in our office helping us do a lot of the coordination of that work. We currently are funded by the Office of Refugee Resettlement, Tim Kelly. Um, he's our guy, too. Um, he uh, so they, they provide our core services. We're now a funded partner. Um, we have some local community foundation funding as well. Now, Salah. So as, as, uh, as Pam mentioned, uh, the program is partnership between JBS and the Jewish Family Service as the lead agency, and you become a family medicine. And Jameson. And we also collaborate. We have collaboration with other uh, local agencies like Jericho Road. Uh, they have health clinics. Uh, they have the shelter as well. Viva La Plaza. Uh, UB uh, Social Work. Uh, Lakeshore Behavioral Health. Uh, physicians for Human Rights. So the progress, um, progress so far since 2017, we have uh, served about 176 clients. These they come from, as you can see, from 20 countries. Uh, most of the, our clients come from Middle East and, and Africa. Central Africa. Uh, we conducted, we coordinated and conducted around say four physical physical forensics, 28 psychological forensics, and out of these we have a couple of uh, um, cases which are already approved for asylum, and most of the many cases are still waiting. Good morning. So I'm going to present a couple of cases. This is one of the successful cases. And we have many successful cases. So um, many of our clients, it's so difficult to contact with them and bring them to our program. So I'm sure probably if you translate torture in your language, the people bilingual, trilingual, it's so difficult word. So we don't use, I mean, when we call, we don't use this word.
for telling the NER for waiting for central for survival of torture. We try to make it easy for them. Just mention like we are care manager. We are help. We are help to help you. There is uh, again some services. We oh, I'm sorry, yeah. So and we focus on case management more than I mean mention the mental health as better mentioned that uh, there's a stigma uh, for this population and they don't want to talk about that. So this is a client, uh, he's from Middle East. Uh, while we do outreach to ESL classes or uh, some of, uh, I mean, restaurant agency to provide some uh, uh, orientation about the program. So I found this client come after me and when we start to talk about signs and symptoms, and he was hesitating to share this to primary doctor or people. And he came after me, he said, Ali, can you help? So I have these symptoms and I'm, I'm, I'm suffering every day. So we brought him, I mean, you find some people that are communicating with you, and sometimes you find people you spend a lot of time just to, to reach them, like two months, just calling them. They don't feel trust or safe to communicate with, with people. So this person, he, he has a bachelor's degree in, in engineering. Uh, he lost his all his family, and he don't know where's their body. Uh, uh, I mean, in, in his country. So the community helped him to leave his country, and he moved to another country. When Arab Spring start, there is another war start in, in his in your country. So spending another three years in in the area with torture on. Uh, so and he lost. I mean, he. he I, now, I mean, what, he's going to to Erie Community College, he's very successful, uh, and he want to marry, and he want to find a job. But see, there's a lot of, I mean, the challenging that faced this person with, I mean, almost tried two times to end his life. I mean, with, I mean he, he's, he was lost when he came to Buffalo in 2013. So, have no community connection. So we try to help him with psychoeducation, uh, refer him to a mental health clinic, a medical uh, clinic. Uh, also try to send him uh, to find job, or also um, uh, try to connect him with the social. I, sometimes it's really important to 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 link him with the with the religious organization, depending on his spirituality or or social, to keep him busy. And we have many passionate community when I talk with them, I build connection with them, so I tell them I have a client here after I take a, a consent. So can you do visit for this person? Just go with him out or shopping or something to keep this person busy and feel connected with the community and adjust the life here. So, um, yeah, this is one of the successful, uh, and he's doing uh, wonderful uh, every day. Um, there is trauma, there is a, he has a depression, anxiety, uh, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, difficult with adjusting the life. All of these, I, with coping skill mechanism and also with medication, he's living in a normal life. It's still trauma in his life, but he's doing well day by day. I mean, the more he connects with school, with making family, big connection, going to spiritual, uh, Faith based place, so he, I see him a lot of progress in his life. And another case from Africa. So, this lady, we spent a lot of time <coughs> to reach her. Uh, the militia killed her husband and her older son. So, uh, and sometimes I speak Arabic language on Persian, but you find somebody speaking different language. so. It's difficult to communicate. What, I mean, to to call. So I need to hire an interpreter. So if this person call and she feel this is person from her community, she doesn't feel comfortable to tell. I mean, why you are calling? Uh, what's the reason? Because probably for some people, reading phone. I heard from many of my clients. It's really traumatizes. Always they put it on silence, and uh, because the phone remind them to tragedy or to things happen in their life. So they don't want to answer the phone. So for this lady with her son, uh, she lived in Buffalo. Uh, she was sexually assaulted. I mean, uh, she was raped there. Um, she has PTSD, depression, and anxiety. Uh, 
something so difficult to adjust the life of living with person. But you, when I meet with them, even I live in a war zone in Iraq, so every day when I meet with these clients, they inspire me to see there is a lot of, as the director mentioned, you see them, I mean, they have a hope, and there is a lot of strength inside them. So you just need to, to help them, I mean, reach these goals. So they suffer, and uh, there is a beautiful saying, what is not kill you, make you strong, right? So we see all, many of these people, they, while well, they live these challenges in, that, in their lives, so they still, I mean, uh, I mean, want to reach their goals, and especially with building rapport with them and helping them. So in our program, uh, we focus on different area in terms of uh, housing, uh, education, employment, uh, safety, health, uh, etc. And this is, uh, I mean, play a big role in terms of anxiety and. Uh, all of these reduce their anxiety and help them to adjust their life. And in the same time, while we are doing provide these services, we provide psychoeducation. We provide uh, uh, some coping skills, and also make the client feel comfortable that it's okay when you feel. I mean, you have. I mean, symptoms. So it's okay to go to mental health clinic. We help them to normal. Uh, normalize this, I mean, symptoms that it's, uh, while you have a headache or you have a stomach ache, you need to go to the doctor. You need now with sleeping problem, with nightmare, with the flashback, you, you need to see a counselor. And many of our uh, survivors, they used to connect with friends and they consider you friends uh, more than because you visit them. We, we, are, we have a very flexible program to do a home visit, to go with them, to, I mean, sit in a, in a coffee shop, to make it, uh, I mean, easy, not that formal, and spending more time, I mean, with, with the client. So they feel that they are able to open uh, uh, to you and discuss their details uh, about their lives to, to help them, and while they talk, they cure uh, from these uh, things. We, we see this client, she's very successful in terms of working on, uh, I mean, focusing on her life uh, and uh, ben get benefit from the services. Thank you, Ali. This is um, the PowerPoint for that I was hiding there. Those are the things that um, we do, and uh, we're going to. The care coordination is the middle of that. Uh, we do, as they both say, we don't, we are not psychiatrists or, well, some of us are psychologists, but we don't work in that capacity. We work into like working with the client, see what they need and what we can help them with. Then we refer them and try to make their life better. Uh, yeah, so I'll talk about those people, those who partner with these people. Yeah. yeah. So, what do we do as a care coordination? Um, again, I will emphasize the uh, model for the Western New York Center for Survival of Torture. As you've seen, many of the care coordinators, they have been through uh, that transition of leaving their countries and coming here. So, I think if it, it's a good model because most of them, they understand what those clients go through, uh, so it's easier for them to empathize, but also to understand what was that journey and what those people need to be uh, integrated in this society with their problems. Um, so at the beginning, we do an intake for the client. Um, through, it can be, um, it's an official intake, but it can happen anywhere, depending on the circumstances uh, we see that person in, in uh, most of the time people came to us as uh, referred from other uh, agencies so they know that the person had been tortured or had a torture uh, story so we see that person who give an intake um, to be able to uh, know exactly at what level that person had been uh, tortured and what he what went through and we are able to know um, with him what services the person needs. Um, 
we provide, as we say, the psychoeducation to these people because they come from a different side of the world and they, they of course, have their own belief in the way of doing things. Uh, we work with them to uh, make them uh, understand how is it here and uh, work on their psycho side of things uh, with that kind of education. We have many people, especially asylum seekers, uh, as I am saying, asylum seekers, they, when they arrive here, they are not even recognized as a status. They don't have a status. Um, most of them, they have gone through torture because of their government, their political uh, situation in their countries. So when they arrive to the immigration officer, they need a proof they have been tortured. So you don't have a document for that. If the government torture you, they don't give you a certificate for that. Uh, so when you arrive here, after two or three years, um, the officer say, okay, um, we need proof. We know that in some countries, uh, like uh, in Congo, for example, the rebels have declared themselves that they use rape as their weapon. Beside the, 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 the guns, they have rape as the weapon. So how do you prove that uh, after two or three years? So we, uh, in partnership with the University of Buffalo, we have people who do the forensics, and they are able to provide a document to that person that proves that the person has been tortured, either mentally or physically. So that person is likely to get uh, asylum he's looking for if his case is proved uh, credible. Uh, we also do uh, referrals. Uh, as we see someone who needs this kind of services, uh, we refer that person to the best services he can get through uh, agencies or government institutions, either hospitals or schools or other kind of uh, services. We also have other supportive services. As we said, for example, many people have mentioned uh, family problems. When the parents arrive here, in, especially actually in the orientation, they, they told them about the child protection, you know, the, the, the organization, child protection services. And they tell them how the child protection services is very, very tough. If you touch your kid, you're going to be either in prison or they're going to take your kid away. That's a shock for a parent who is coming from Africa, Asia, or any kind of a side. Because the kids, uh, when they do uh, something bad, the parents have to correct the kid. But the first information they get from you is that if you touch your kid or say bad word to your kid, you're going to be in prison, you're going to take your child away. So that is shock, but it also it's something that creates something in the mind of the parent that I'm no longer in control of my children. Uh, how, what can I do? Most of the time they just let, they just let it go, they, they abandon the kids, they let them do what they want because they don't want to be in jail or have their kids taken away. So we try to help these parents with a parenting program to uh, make the transition uh, smoother and be able to continue to educate their children, uh, but also with respecting the, 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 the laws that they have in place. Um, we have mental health services program. We have a special program uh, that actually Pam initiated, uh, it was a her initiative, helping the deaf refugees have refugees, you know, we say that refugees have problems with the communication, but imagine of those refugees, they have their deaf. They, they, back in their country, they have a communication problem. Imagine when they arrive here, what happens to them? They use the sign language, the traditional sign language, just only between the family. They know if their mothers do something, they know what she's talking about. Only if the person arrives here, if you go to the doctor, if you go anywhere, how that person is going to communicate? So there's a class of uh, American Sign Languages for deaf refugees and other services around that, uh, that class that help them to integrate uh, better. Uh, so as I say, we have uh, an approach as the person coming in our office, into our offices through a referral or we spot that person in 
this or that condition. We do an inquiry and an identification of the issues. We try to work with the client and the client has to participate because we cannot pretend to know the person more than he know himself. We try to help him discover himself and discover what he needs, what kind of help they need. With this, with the, this orientation that comes with the transition, we try to help him understand what he's going through and what he needs. And we do education, as uh, we said before, we advocate. Most of the time we have, we have a client who has nine legal cases with a, we have a client with nine legal cases with the government, IRS and all this kind of stuff, and child protection. That client doesn't know what to do. The client doesn't want to go to work because he's saying that if you go to work, anyway, the money is going to gain, the IRS is going to take it back. So how do you help that person? We do advocacy, we work with the IRS and the child protection to make them understand what is that person going through, how can they can help him get better, maybe pay them back after if possible. Facilitate, we facilitate uh, our clients. We, most of the time we, we act as drivers, take our clients to the hospital to, if there is something going on at home with the parents, and between parents and kids, we rush there during the night, we record during the night, we go there, try to help them, so try to orient them. Uh, what do you take your question? What, who can understand you more? What do you need? So you do all of the stuff we do facilitate and um, we document all our clients. We have a database uh, for our clients, of course, uh, respecting the regulation about um, the privacy of information about clients, but we, we, uh, we document uh, our client cases. So I'm going to let Ali, we talked about community involvement, Ali is going to talk, thank you for that. Well, thank you. Thank you. So, since 2008, when I came to this country, um, I came from a culture that when I walk in, in my city, everyone say hello to you. Um, it's, it's very social connected. Um, you know these people from generation to generation. So, coming here, um, it's difficult. I want to say hello to my neighbor, but sometimes he looks to me, who's this person? I say hello. So, I, I found it so difficult to adjust life um, here. So uh, I started to uh, learn how to organize people. And I found it is uh, living in war zone and coming here. What helped me, my community helped me, my faith, my family, friends. This is really important in our life to have this connection. So if any crisis we have, so we, we found this support system. So when refugee come here, I said, let me go for leadership training. And I went to New York City and I came back. I started to work with immigrant and refugee to organize community. And we have very passion leaders from different community to, to help them. We, we sit monthly to uh, find what is the priority. This is the passion. This is not related to my work. So just to, to help them, what is the priority needs for refugees in, in, in Buffalo? So what are we supposed to do? We have family, we have I mean kids, we have problem growing every day. And service provider, they are doing great, but our job starts from morning until I mean the second day, our phone is always ready. So uh, we are not able to say no if somebody in a crisis in the police department and I mean, they are in a hospital with language barrier. So the community members play the big roles in, in a society. So these passion leaders, I mean, we provide training to them monthly to help their community. So when I start my, I mean, professional work as a, a, a social worker and also care coordinator with Jewish Family Service, I found it, this is really perfect. So there is Imam or Pastor called and said, Ali, I try to help this person to, to in, in terms of using spirituality, healing. Um, I found it so difficult. Can you help? So we go out, or they send these people to us to, to link them with the faith uh, organization or uh, try to, to help them with the, with the services in Buffalo. 
So we see a lot of community like uh, Burmese, uh, uh, Bhutanese, uh, other organizations in Iraqi, they started to get 501c3 and they became more self-sufficient in terms of serving on people, refugees serving refugees. Uh, I mean this term, to, to help their own people and there's a lot of service provider organization helping the community. So we found that it's, it's really helpful because I mean we probably I see the client for uh, an hour and this client go back to home. So our focus is how to create safety environment around this client in terms of his culture, in terms of they have an emergency things. Uh, do you have friends? Do you have people you know in, in your city? So to, to, to help me in this part because you can't do everything. So you have to link all these people with their community to, uh, to, to participate in any activities, cultural things, food celebration, and keep this person busy. So this is our main work is uh, to, to link uh, our client with uh, uh, re religious communities and also with uh, uh, the community members. Good afternoon, Al. Good afternoon. Uh, Ali mentioned uh, refugees. Uh, yes, I, I agree with that. But also, we do have uh, nonprofit organizations that help uh, refugees as well. Uh, one of the organizations is uh, PATH, uh, People Against uh, Trafficking Human, and uh, it's a great organization. I have uh, approximately like 10 clients refer to these organizations just because they are awesome. They care about people, they offer uh, different uh, classes uh, such as like art therapy, music therapy, uh, anger management, uh, counseling, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, counseling, like you name it and they have it. Uh, what I hear of the running is one of my clients uh, mentioned once like that's the best thing that happened to her and she came in 2000 while in the United States. So, uh, we also do have uh, other organizations such as Stitch Buffalo, uh, which are uh, unprofit organizations. Uh, there are two ladies, they work with the refugees women. There is like 50 women. They uh, learn how to stitch and uh, what they're doing are they selling their products. And 75% out of the products, uh, you know, when they sell it, they give it to them. And for like 25% they buy the material. So, um, Finding that kind of places, it's very helpful uh, for people with lots of trauma. Before I talk about our challenges as a group and challenges we are dealing with daily on the work, I'm going to back up a little bit. And um, the piece of paper, you already have it. Uh, can you please put it over? And uh, once you come from your country, once you have everything behind you, you're so happy you're coming to the United States, as uh, Dr. Sharma says, uh, you start again. So you're so happy, you're so excited, you're safe, you feel safe. And um, you come to the United States and you go to the agency. They send someone or, you know, they find a way to help you. Do. So uh, I'm going to share my experience. So this is my experience. Once we came to the agency, they gave us a piece of paper. You guys have it? Yeah. So uh, now, please follow my directions. And if you have any questions, please raise your hand and let me help you. Okay? Molly was an appreciator. I should do what you may be The question address will be great. I'll do my material copy, Pita, and I'm all of us. And we beat the ass into the lamp. Stvarno mi je žao, ja ne znam što mi pitate, so, pitate još jednom. Stvarno mi je žao, vaše Stvarno mi je žao vaše prvo ime i prijezme, adresa i druga telefona. Ja sam 
j'ai écrit votre adresse et votre téléphone sur le papier qu'on vous a donné. C'est bon Je vais C'est très facile. Ok Ok Let's try this in English. Simple as this. Can you please put your first name, your last name, your address and your phone number? Are you guys going to be able to do that? Of course you are. Because I'm speaking your language. And when I came to US, nobody spoke Bosnians or Arabic or French. I'm talking 15 years ago. And I'm so glad we grow a lot. We, yes, we are. So now, we do have our challenges, but we also do have uh, solutions. We have access to many things, such as uh, language lines. But what about transition of interpreters? I want to share a story. Uh, I had a, a, a client another day, and I was using a language line. And in the middle of conversation, I had an interpreter say, like, she, she took her time to recover. She was crying. She didn't know who the patient was, but she heard the story. So it is hard. Stigma. You all know about stigma. It is a big issue. Big issue that we have to deal with every single day. Uh, we do have all stuff trained and multi, you know, multicultural, and I do understand people who are coming from Bosnia, from Serbia, from Croatia, but I do not understand people who are coming from Iraq, Iran, Sudan, Africa. They have, they have different culture. For me, it's a learning experience every single day. Before I get my client, before I get a client assigned to me, what I do? I Google. I Google. Where the person is coming from? Who is the person? What is what is a culture like? What I have to know, basic things I have to know about the person, just to show that I care and I do care. So, funding for support groups and expanded peer monitoring program. Even though we try and we want to help people, there is a big problem, and you all know the funding is a big problem. So. Uh, lack of systematic support of asylum seekers. Um, asylum seekers, they survived the trauma back in their country and they are surviving a second trauma once they come here to the United States. Even though we want to help them, there is we simply, you know, sometimes we don't, we don't have a solution. We offer them the basics such as food, shelter, Medicaid, you know, transportation. Sometimes. But many times we are not able to. So we, do, we have not enough legal services um, providers. Yes and no. Yes, we do have legal services providers. But yes, we do have a lot of refugees and asylum seekers who need help. And there is a long waiting list. So that's basically what we are dealing for. Uh, we have like on a daily basis. Um, I do my job because I'm passionate about it and I love it. So that's why it gives me say like day after day. Uh, I want to be there for those people who help them move forward. Maybe they're mentally sick, maybe they're not. But it's always good that you have someone on your side to tell you you're okay. Thank you. So we are still waiting
and the interpreters as uh, another mention, uh, the traumatization of interpreters and also care coordinators. For us, for the care coordinators, most of the time we uh, with the team meetings, these, these are venues for us to discuss those type of challenges, uh, to, to share our concerns and support each other. And also, to, uh, we, we always operate as a team in and out the our institution. We have lots of events uh, in the community. Uh, we participate in that. This is also uh, help us a lot in the in our theory. Uh, also, we need to raise awareness of the trauma and health care, especially for refugees. People talk a lot about uh, trauma and health care, but for refugees, there is a lot of cultural competency needed because people come from different cultures and they have lots of challenges when they come and they want to access a uh, healthcare system and navigate all the providers in the US. So we want to introduce that or we want, uh, we have actually, there is a training that we're going to go through with uh, UV social work. Uh, it's on trauma informed care, which I think will, will help us a lot. And we will see if we can, as is helping introducing this uh, refugee trauma informed care. There is, yesterday I remember James, I think from Uganda, asked a question about uh, prevention. Instead of just we deal with uh, treating people, we have to work in prevention and so uh, we want to advocate, we want to do advocacy for elimination or at least reduce elimination, I think it's a little hard, but at least reduce these torture practices in the globe. So we're going to finish up with a video that was made in Buffalo. Um, it's, um, I love this video, I'm really glad that we can share it with you. And I think it really summarizes the, the environment that we work within and the message of hope that we receive every day. At night, I was uh, in the city named Mansoor about 7 p.m. One day, my son got to the school. I just was subconscious, and everything, the people came and knocked the door, broke the door, and took everybody outside. And after a while, he came back because he said there's a man. Is it on the class? People in the street, they stopped me. They were killing people around me. They tried to kidnap me from the car. They are shutting the people in front of my house. Then we start to run in the to back to see us running away. They start to shadow us. They gonna ask my family for money and they gonna kill me after that. I was young, but uh, I could see what was going on and it was hard to see. It was so, so horrible. It was so dangerous to stay home. So I decided to move. Life in Bosnia before was awesome. We were living like peacefully. I grew up a good life because my mom's family were good financially. I had a small business, my restaurant over there. We have some problem, we uh, have some good, it's uh, normal. But uh, eventually, uh, like, you know, We didn't know that we are living for forever. Almost all the young people, they can't live in the country. We were never in a refugee camp. I live in a refugee camp. For three years in a refugee camp, I grew up in a refugee camp. You don't know what you're going to happen. I think at one point we were going to end up in Finland, and then at another point we were going to end up in Sweden. There's a lot of protests. Actually, we had screening before we get uh, approval. Finally, it was they told us you're going to end up in Buffalo, New York. We thought it was New York City, but it wasn't. 